Welcome back. We're at lecture 34. Uh, we're in the supplement to the textbook, which is uh, second order differential equations. Uh, we're actually kind of scheduled to start a new section, but we've had a couple web assigned uh, situations that uh, might need to be addressed. One of them is one that I actually had as an example to show what could happen with the particular solution. And the other one, let's just take a look at that. At least enough of it where you feel like you can take it from that point. One of the web assigned problems from 7.8 looks like this. Does anybody have the printout so you know which one it is? Number two. Number two? Okay. Um, they give you the complementary solution, or what we have called the homogeneous solution. We could figure that out. It would probably take less than a minute. Get the uh, characteristic equation, r squared plus 2r plus 1. Uh, if you factor it, that would be r plus 1, the quantity squared, double root of negative 1. So if we have a double root of negative 1, then we ought to have C1 e to the negative x plus C2x e to the negative x. Does that look right for that part? I think that's given to you, but certainly have the ability to come up with that very quickly. That's part of our answer. I think it's our job in this problem to find the particular solution. Um, So we've, we've got a generic linear term there. So if we wanted to kind of characterize what that is, that would be something of the form ax plus b would generate, have the potential to generate something like that. Um, we're going to change this, but we could also kind of generalize e to the negative x. If we want to end up with an e to the negative x, we can start with a certain amount of e to the negative x's. I think we had a problem like this uh, two days ago in class where the d could be distributed to these. We don't know what they are anyway, so it's really kind of redundant to have that. So we can kind of dispense with that. Um, if you were to distribute this solution, or the proposed particular solution, you'd have a x e to the negative x plus b e to the negative x. Anybody see a problem? Okay. Aren't both of those up here? This is really this, right? We don't know what a is. We don't know what c is. So they're, I mean, they're both the same. So that's really not going to be the particular solution. This solution is right here. So both of these pieces, it seems to not be enough. Well, we're not going to need an x e to the negative x term. We might as well dispense with that completely. We're not going to need a constant times e to the negative x either. So we kind of throw that out at this point and try again. Well, if the x e to the negative x we don't need and the constant e to the negative x, what do we do from that point? multiply by x squared. So here's what we don't need to do, which is kind of typical to what we do need to do on some other problems. This is not going to be correct. We don't need to say, OK, now we failed with this linear expression times e to the negative x. Let's come up with some arbitrary quadratic. Well, we don't need this, and we don't need this. We've already ruled those out. Those don't help us. Those are pieces to the uh, homogeneous solution. So we could go ax squared e to the negative x. If I remember this problem correctly, that also does not work. And that's really frustrating, kind of annoying, borderline annoying. Now it actually crosses over. It is annoying. Um, so this doesn't work. You can't generate 
x e to the negative x with that as well, even though it's not part of the particular solution. So this kind of came up the other day in class too. If we determined that this, and some of you had success on this problem, right? You determined that this was not the particular solution. How would you determine that? Maple. <laughs> what? <laughs> Say that again, Jacob. Maple. Maple? Oh, okay. Well, that would, could be a determining factor if you had accessibility to maple, which we don't have on a test. I tried to do it and ended up with something weird like a, a, 2a equals 1 and 2a equals 0 or something. Yeah, it, I, I remember that trying to plug this in, this is kind of bizarre, and we do not get a solution for a. So we rule that out after some effort. You do this and you do this and you plug them into the original equation and you're going to try to generate and one x e to the negative x and it's impossible to do that with this problem with this particular solution so we scrap that one as well and then we go on to a x cubed e to the negative x and from what I remember about this problem you can successfully get a solution for A starting with this as your particular solution? Uh, yes, product rule. So there's the first term of your product, there's the second term of your product. Um, would you have to, because you didn't really determine that AX squared e to the negative x wasn't, did we determine that that wasn't part of the solution? Like, would you not have to Add a, make it a quadratic, including. Uh, like I'm sorry. Like in the first part, we did. We crossed out in this. Well, on our second try, we didn't use when we did a x squared plus b x plus c. We didn't use b and b x plus c because we they're part of the homogeneous form. They'd, um, they'd be okay. So your set, your question is: Do we need to include the quadratic in this one? Yeah. The quadratic <coughs> did something bizarre. I can't remember what happened, but it it created uh, a problem, and it very well might be part of the um, homogeneous solution. We only found two terms that caused this to be zero with this shortcut. There may, in fact, be more. In fact, maybe this is one of them. So I think once we rule it out, we don't need it anymore. So when we realize that it failed here, the quadratic term failed, we can just go on up, and as it says in the uh, recommendation, if I can find it, well, I can't find that recommendation, that it says if you fail with one, keep multiplying it by x. Modification, I think they call it a modification principle or whatever in the reading. But uh, when we fail with this one, we m multiply it by x and try again. Yeah, that does work. Ax cubed e to the negative x does work. And when you do the problem, you can find a value for a. So you're not putting in a into your answer. You'll know a number for a that works in this problem. So hopefully that'll jumpstart you on that problem if that one caused some difficulty. The other problem that was recommended that we take a brief look at So we have a little extra information at the end. What, what purpose does this serve? Why would, what additionally are we going to be able to do by the fact that we know the y of 0 is 1 or the y prime of 0 is 0? Find our c values. In our c values, values from, the, homogeneous. from the homogeneous part of the solution. Um, is this one where they gave you? The complementary part or the homogeneous part? Okay. So r squared plus r minus 2, characteristic equation. 
So we need factors of negative 2 that will give us plus 1 in the middle, plus 2, minus 1. Does that work? So C1e to the negative 2x plus C2e to the x. values now? Okay, that's a good question. I was going to ask that, but since then I decided not to, but since you did, let's go ahead and <laughs> finding the C values now. So should we bring this into play and this into play now? No. no. Because that is the final Y. That's not just Y sub H of 0 equals 1. So that's the final Y of 0 equals 1. So we've got some work to do. If this were a homogeneous equation, then we can opt right now to solve for uh, C1 and C2, but we've got some other work to do before we do that, which does affect the Y of 0 being 1, potentially. Uh, you could do this in pieces, or you could do this all at once. The only way you're going to be able to generate an X term on the right side is to start with what? X plus B. Do you see any reason why we would have to kind of get rid of any part of that solution based on what we have thus far in the homogeneous solution? Don't see any double roots or duplicity of roots or anything. So I think that should work. We should be able to go through and find out A and B so that we could generate 1x. And then the second piece, I'm just trying to get it to the point where you feel like you could take it over. Now we've got to generate one sine of 2x. How could we generate one sine of 2x? Cosine 2x plus sine 2x. Okay. Give me some more other than that. A cosine. Right. We don't know how many sines to start with, and we don't know how many cosines, but you've got the right terms. We need a sine, um, let's say C cosine 2x plus d sine 2x. And then you can go through and that's the only way you're going to generate that kind of term is with one or the other of those. Do we probably need them both? What happened in a problem uh, Wednesday in here? Yeah, we didn't really need them both because we only had the original function and its second derivative, which were the same, right? If you start with a sine and you take the derivative twice, aren't you back to a sine? We need them both here because we've got the original function and the first derivative and the second derivative. We're hoping to keep the sines involved in the problem, but we eventually want the cosines to drop out. But we need to start with both of them. Question? For P1, when you take the second derivative of that, it's just zero. So is that supposed to happen? Mm -hmm. Okay. But the, the uh, issue is, can we generate 1x by plugging in something like this for the particular solution, and yes, we can with that term, because the y term has an x in it. The derivative term doesn't have an x in it, but that's okay. It's present here. So any issues about what to do to find a and b from this point? I'm not going to go all the way through it, because I know what else we have to do today. Everybody okay with that? Take the first derivative, second derivative, plug it into here, and try to generate 1x. See what a and b have to be in order for that to happen. Start again. Find the first derivative, second derivative with the second piece of the particular solution. Plug them in here on the left side and try to generate 1 sine of 2x and solve for c and d in order to do that. This is kind of a lengthy problem because you're not done at that point in time. Once you find A and B, if in fact they're both present, which I know A is, I don't know if B is or not, and C and D, then you come up with the, the final solution.
Does anybody happen to have the A and B and C and D values for this problem? Andy? So this won't be a, this will be a, a number. I'm going to have an A here, but you'll have a number by this point in time in the problem. You'll have a number there. Uh, I used a C. I probably shouldn't have. So let's call this uh, D. You'll have a number there. And you'll have a number there. So the only unknowns at this point in time in the problem are C1 and C2. Some of these might be gone. I mean, it's possible that, I, don't, I think you're going to need them both, but it is possible that D or E could be zero. Then you would need to bring these into play. Right? Take the original equation for y, plug in 1. Every time you see an x, plug in a 0. And then see what value for c1 or c2 would give you a y of 0 equals 1. Um, probably going to have an equation with C1 and C2 both in it, right? And then take the derivative of this long mess that we have now, plug in 0 for x, and it should kick out 0 for y prime, which will be on this side. So I think you're going to have an equation with C1 and C2 here, an equation with C1 and C2 here. Put those two equations with the two unknowns together either substitution, linear combination, something to get the two solutions. That's a lengthy problem. Probably an unfair test question. It just takes too long. If that would be the only question on the test, then it would probably be fair, but that's probably... Chances of that happening are... Uh, well, there's two chances of that happening, slim and none. Okay, so you're going to have more than one problem on the test. Nicole. Can you please go back to P1? Yes. That you just did. I, I just, I don't even know what to do. You need the derivative to plug in there. Which is what? A. You need the second derivative to plug in up there. Which is zero. Right. So when you plug those things in, let's go ahead and do that. Second derivative is 0 plus the first derivative, which is a, sorry, minus 2 of the original y things. And we want to somehow figure out what it takes to generate the x term, the linear term. We're not going to generate the sine of 2x with this stuff. So when you equate the coefficient of x on the left side, which is going to be what? What's coefficient of x on the left side? Negative 2a. It better be equal to 1. So that's the only x term on this side. Everything else would be a constant. So a and what? Minus 2b? So the coefficient of x here better be equal to the coefficient of x here. And this constant on the left side better equal the constant on the right side, while the constant on the right side is 0. So a is what? Negative 1 half, which makes b what? Negative one fourth looks right. So back to what I wrote out earlier. Once you write out the particular solution, I wrote out a x plus b. We're going to know what a is. A is negative a half. B is negative a fourth. So when you write this part out, you just plug the a and b back into your y of b, e, and that's it. Like the values that you found for a. And yes. So the first piece of the particular solution 
instead of just being ax plus b is negative a half x minus one fourth. Now you go on to the second particular solution and find, I wrote it C and D, probably would have been better written D and E. Okay, if you have your supplement with you or the copy that I made of the supplement, there are a couple of diagrams that I think are helpful to look at as we go into Section 7.9, not a big deal is made about some things on the picture, but I, I think we want to point out some things. Um, I know it seems awkward that the page number is uh, 1,172, but the first page on 7.9 You'll see a couple diagrams, and let me back up a half a step. So we're going to do some applications now, some of which we've actually kind of started a little bit when we looked at um, how it is we might need to use or apply second-order differential equations, one of which was a spring. We talked about the uh, Hooke's Law and, and the restoring force and mass times acceleration, those kinds of things. They've already been mentioned in here one time, but the diagrams that you see on the left side of the page, you see um, the spring with the mass here at the bottom of the spring. Notice the scale out to the right, that if this is in equilibrium position, it's, it shouldn't be a mystery that the equilibrium position is zero. But look what happens when you go down the scale. It's a subtle way of telling you that in this particular model, down is positive, this diagram. So as we go, let's say we've got this mass at the end of the spring. It sits here at its equilibrium position. In order to start the mass in motion, let's say we pull the mass down and release it. Well, we need to prepare ourselves for the fact that pulling the mass down and releasing it down is positive on this particular picture. Now, the other picture, it's not a stretch for you to think of. We've got a spring here. They've got a scale down here on the other direction where the equilibrium position is here, and they move it out to the right, and it's not a stretch. Probably shouldn't use that word. It's not a leap to think that moving it out to the right beyond its equilibrium is positive. That seems positive, but this one doesn't really seem positive. Down we normally think as negative, but it's positive here. That kind of starts the oscillation. And you say, in this particular model, if there isn't any friction, which we start, the first model we look at doesn't have any friction at all. I know that's not good, but then we'll see what happens when we throw friction into the picture. So if you take this mass that's at the bottom of the spring and you pull it down, positive, beyond equilibrium, and then you release it, it's going to oscillate, so the sp spring the position of the spring over time, it's going to go back up beyond its equilibrium and then come back down. And if there isn't any friction, it's going to oscillate indefinitely. Does that make sense? This spring, once we set it in motion, is just going to stay in motion forever. There's no friction to stop it. So it looks a little bit redundant when you say it goes back up here, comes back down to here. Well, let's get a picture that kind of scrolls for time. So if we let T be along this axis, where is it? What's it do? Well, we started it up here. As you scroll time, it comes back down here, and then it goes back up to where it was and then it comes back down here, and then it goes back up to where it was. So we've got this nice little oscillatory model. In reality, it's going kind of 
moving in, in a straight line, but if you let time scroll along the axis and show how it moves, how would you, what would you say that type of oscillatory model is? Sine, cosine, cosine or sine plus cosine? Because if it is a sine plus a cosine, we could, and we've already done this once, we could put that in, for, in the form of a sine only or a cosine only. And this might be a good time to take an answer that we had earlier in this class, four or five days ago. We graphed this. I'm not going to graph the whole thing again. But we graphed the sine, we graphed the cosine, we added them up on the coordinate plane, and we ended up with a function that itself was oscillatory. We went back and revisited that, and we gave it um, an amplitude of square root of 2. Is that ringing a bell? The final graph that was sine plus cosine, we went back and revisited that another day, and we said if the period of this is 2 pi and the period of this is 2 pi, when you add them together, they have the same period, which was also 2 pi. So we left the coefficient of x 1, and then we figured out, kind of backed it up a little bit and figured out what the phase shift was. I'm not getting any good visual prompts from you. Is this ringing a, bit, a distant bell? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And what was that phase shift to the left? Good. Okay. I thought maybe I was talking Spanish there for a while. I do that from time to time. So this sine graph with a changed amplitude, up the square root of 2 units, down the square root of 2 units, period of 2 pi, and a phase shift of pi over 4 to the left, is exactly the same graph as sine x plus cosine x. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but I think it might actually be worthwhile to do this. We, we drew pictures, and I don't have the pictures here right now, so since we don't have the picture, Let's see if you remember this. Might not be a fair question. The sine of the sum of two things. What is that? Sine of... How is that? Does that look familiar? I guess it was a fair question. <coughs> Thank you. Now let's what are our two what are our A and B values? Well A is just X, we're not going to be able to do much with that. But B is pi over four. So let's see what we get from the sine of X plus pi over four. So it should be the sine of the first, cosine of the second. plus cosine of the first, sine of the second. Everybody okay that this equation kind of morphs into this equation with this sine of a sum identity? What's an exact value for the cosine of pi over 4? What's an exact value for the sine of pi over 4? Same thing, yeah. right? Sine of pi over 4 and cosine of pi over 4 are the same. All right, let's distribute the square root of 2 to both terms. So what's the square root of 2 times the sine of x times the square root of 2 over 2? 
Right. Sine x. Is that right? What's the square root of 2 times the cosine of x times the square root of 2 over 2? Just cosine of x. Is that what we started with? Sine x plus cosine of x was our original. So they are the same. I'm, and we're not validating that by a picture. We're validating that kind of algebraically with some trig identities thrown in. So you can take this thing that is sum of sines and cosines and write it as a single sine function. This is called a phase amplitude form. In your supplement, on the top of page 1173, you will see kind of some conversion, some interrelationships between something given to us in this form and how to convert that into the so-called phase amplitude form. Uh, I'm going to actually give you something slightly different from this that I think um, simplifies it a little better. So that if we have an answer that is the sum of sines and cosines, so this is a unit circle. And it's a unit circle centered at the origin, so the equation is x squared plus y squared equals 1. Here is a point on that unit circle. This angle phi, or phi, is actually this angle right here. So it's from the 0 radian or 0 degree mark rotated through positive phi or phi radians, which takes us to this place in the plane. So here is a point on the unit circle. Uh, typically, when you see a point on the unit circle, the x value, I'm hoping that some of this rings a bell because we haven't really looked at any of this in this course. The x value is the cosine of the angle that brought you to that point. The y value is the sine of the angle that brought you to that place in the plane. So from this angle, phi or phi, we have the cosine of phi is a over the square root of a squared plus b squared. The sine of phi is b over the square root of a squared plus b squared. <clears throat> so those things are stated right down here. Do you remember that from a unit circle, that the x value is the cosine of what got you there, and the y value is the sine of what got you there? I guess we could validate that by saying the x value is here and the y value is here and the hypotenuse is 1, right? And you could say sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and you could come up with these identities. So you can, if that's distant for you, then mess with that a little bit till you feel assured that this is legitimate information. Um, so far, we haven't deviated a whole lot. I guess we're going to deviate from this one that's in the supplement because they convert it to a cosine, and we're going to convert it to a sine. Maybe one more thing before we completely leave this diagram alone. This is supposed to be true. Uh, if you plug in the x value, you get the cosine of the angle, cosine squared, plug in the y value, you get sine squared. Certainly cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. You could also plug in the coordinates. If you take the cosine, or in this case the x value, and square it, plug in the sine value and square it, or call it the y value, that's the same thing. You can check that out to verify that you do, in fact, get 1 when you square those and add them together. Square the numerator, you get a squared. 
square the denominator, you drop the square root symbol. Square the numerator, you get b squared. Square the denominator, you d drop the square root symbol. These have the same denominator, which is what? a squared plus b squared. If you add the numerators, what do you get? a squared plus b squared, you do get 1. So it does satisfy the unit circle equation. This is going to look familiar, but we had specific numbers earlier. I'm going to propose that the amplitude in the phase amplitude form is going to be the square root of a squared plus b squared. Uh, let me see in the, what do they call this? Yeah, they do call it an omega, a lowercase omega, so I'm going to use the same, looks like a w. In this phase shift angle, the angle that we're talking about on the unit circle diagram is the angle phi. PHI. So that is, let's say that's what, now we had this in terms of X, this particular example has it in terms of T, same thing. If we were to use that sine of a sum again, it would be sine of the first, cosine of the second, plus cosine of the first, sine of the second. From the unit circle, what was the cosine of phi? It was the x value of that point, which was what? A over square root of b squared. And what was the sine? The sine was the y coordinate of that point on the unit circle. B? If we distributed this thing out in front, like we did before, it was a number, it was the square root of 2, now it's the square root of a squared plus b squared, what is the first term? Would there be an a left, oh. right? Because the numerator and denominator would knock out, so you'd have a sine of omega, or w, t. And if you do that same thing to the second term, don't you have a b cosine of omega times t. Isn't that the form that we're going to have when something oscillates, right? Sine plus cosine. Can we take something in this form? This is kind of in reverse, but hopefully it justifies. If it works this way, coming down this page, couldn't we start here and work our way back up to this equation? I mean, if it's an equation, as we work down the page, we should be able to basically say there are equations also as we work up the page. So we're going to have something like this, and we want to put it into this form. So how do we find the amplitude? Well, we're going to have a number here, potentially, and we're going to have a number here. So we are, in which we haven't done this yet, we picked it off of a diagram, didn't we? We added the square root of 2 over 2 to the square root of 2 over 2, and we got the square root of 2 on the diagram. Now we know with numbers, whatever the numbers happen to be, we'll take a, which is the coefficient of sine, and b, which is the coefficient of cosine. We'll square them and add them together, take the square root. That's going to be our amplitude once we put it in this form. Let's check it. We started with this one, right? Should the amplitude have been the square root of 2? Yes. 1 here and 1 here. 1 squared added to 1 squared is 2. Square root of 2, that would be the amplitude. 
Um, I don't want to skip skip over this. This got mentioned, but let's whatever the omega value is here and here, it will also be the same up here. We want the periods of the individual sine and cosine functions to be the same as the period of the so-called phase amplitude form. We want them to all have the same period because they're going to all repeat in the same cycle. So omega is unchanged from the original sine plus cosine equation to the phase amplitude version. How do we get the angle phi? See if this makes sense from our diagram. Back to the unit circle diagram. If the x value is the cosine and the y value is the sine, or if you just wanted to use the right triangle here, Tangent should be what? Sine over cosine? So if we put this thing over this thing, what would you get? B over A. B over A. So if you want to find the so-called uh, phase shift or the phase angle, then take B. Now look at what we have for B. Actually, doesn't that look really good? No, it's not on that page. It's on this page. What is B? B is the coefficient of cosine. Sometimes we write that first. We write the cosine term first and the sine term second. So just remember that B the coefficient of the cosine term is in the numerator. A is the coefficient of the sine term. That's in the denominator. And if we do an inverse tangent problem, then we can get the angle phi. Back to our example. We had sine of x plus cosine of x. If we did tangent of phi, we would get b over a, which they're both 1. Coefficient of cosine is 1. Coefficient of sine is 1. What angle has 1 for its tangent? Five or four, right? And that's not what we got. Not this way, but we got it another way. So this way, we don't have to draw them, figure out what we think is the, the phase shift involved in that graph. We can do this inverse tangent problem. So in our example, we got pi over four. So is it possible without drawing a diagram and I'm going to change to x's now, to go directly from this version to a single sine or cosine. We've got sine. So what's the amplitude? The amplitude is the square root. Don't need a graph for that. Here's a 1, here's a 1. Square them, add them together, and take the square root. Square root of 2. Sine. Well, the coefficient of x here is 1, so our omega or w value is 1. Same thing here, so we're going to have 1x again. Tangent of this angle is the b value over the a value, 1 over 1. What angle has 1 for its tangent? Pi over 4. Now, by adding pi over 4, the net effect is to shift the graph what? Left. So it's actually going left pi over 4. I think we found that to be true on our picture, which we brought over here and saw that it actually was shifted by pi over 4 units to the left. So you can go from this version to this version without graphing it and trying to, you know, figure out from the graph what's the phase shift, what's the amplitude. The periods will always be the same. Nicole? Where did you get the x from? This, this is this one? The, the x in. x here? Yeah. 
whatever the coefficient of x is in the sine and the cosine, it's going to be the same here. Because the period of this sum has got to be the period of the kind of the net single sine or single cosine graph. So that's slightly different from what's in your book, but I, I think getting the amplitude there and getting the phase angle here is going to be a little more straightforward than what is illustrated in the in the book itself. All right, let's set up a problem, and that's probably all we're going to get is the setup. Find the problem. All right, thank you. Hooke's Law, which we have already encountered a couple of times in this class, says that the force required to stretch or compress a spring is directly proportional to the elongation of the spring itself, how long, how far it's already been stretched or compressed. So, we've also used this, that the restoring force then if the force required to stretch or compress it is k times x, that's Hooke's law, directly proportional to how long it's been stretched. The restoring force is that opposite motion. So the restoring force is going to be mass times acceleration And the forces involved in this motion of this spring with a mass at the end of it have got to be equal. So the restoring force basically given to us by Hooke's law and force being mass times acceleration, these forces have to be equal. If you put everything on the same side, you get this. And if you want to make that look a little more familiar to what we've been doing in this material, m is the mass. It's a number. Second derivative of x, which is really just acceleration, but second derivative of x we'll call x double prime, isn't this a second order linear homogeneous differential equation? It is, right? There's nothing in this problem about um, friction or any kind of a damping force at all. When that is thrown into the equation, so here we've got a second order differential equation. When we throw in the um, damping force or the friction into the problem, we're going to have this. And then we'll get this written down, and then we'll stop at that point. Uh, I don't want to write it like this first time. Let me scrap that. So here's our mass times acceleration. We've got our kind of Hooke's Law restoring force over here. Now let me read this. Next, we consider the motion of a spring that is subject to a frictional force in the case of a horizontal spring or a damping force in the case where a vertical spring moves through a fluid. An example of the damping force supplied by a shock, by a shock absorber in a car or a bicycle. Okay, here's the statement that's going to get us what we need out of this equation. We assume that the damping force is proportional to the velocity of the mass and acts in the direction opposite to the motion. Velocity. Well, if this is acceleration, the second derivative of x, what's velocity? First derivative of x. So there's our damping force. There's our friction term. 
So now this is what I was going to write a minute ago, but I wanted to write it in this form first. It would be nice if I could actually write it. Sorry. I want to bring these terms over to this side. X prime is really dx dt. Now we have a second order linear homogeneous equation, but it has all three terms. There's our second derivative term. There's our first derivative term. There's our original x term, and we are equal to zero. We'll pick up at that point.